Hey everybody, the last video about iRacing and uh, the handling model somehow got a couple of views instead of staying under the radar as normally happens. And uh, I got a good question there, is why is tire modeling so difficult? And I said, I'll answer that in a video. So here we are today. Uh, you know what? I don't have a clue. I don't know what the answer is. What? Centerfold. So after a brief study of the appropriate literature, I think I might have a couple of things to say about this. So when you work for a Formula 2 team, for example, what do you get? Well, typically the tire manufacturer will have some data for you, which is excellent. Typically PDF files, spreadsheets, that sort of thing with some numbers about the properties of the tire. Now, some are easy, like the weight of the tire. Sometimes you get the inertia of the tire as well. And you get some data about the size of the tire. Seems very obvious, but can still be useful. Also, the stiffness of the tire, like how squishy the tire is, which is very important because like downforce cars, they press down on the tires and the ride height is important. So. The squishiness of the tire is important, you get data for that. Typically you also get some numbers on how the tire expands as it goes faster. Like an extreme example of the dragster stuff that they have these tires and then they floor it and suddenly they're huge. Um, that stuff you get and it's typically fairly reliable and uh, usable in the simulator because those ride heights, we have them in the sim as well. And the aerodynamics are very sensitive to the ride height also in the simulator. So super important tire data that you can typically get from a manufacturer. But that's nothing to do with grip levels and stuff like that. So if you get data for uh, the grip levels of the tire, here's where things start to get a bit wonky. Um, a lot of the time, all you get is cornering grip data. So slip angle of the tire. So the tire is rolling normally like this and now you're dragging it at a slip angle. You might get some data for that, but only for a little bit of slip angle, perhaps eight degrees or six degrees, right? So that's the point where the grip is sort of maximized, but it's not the drifting or sliding now sort of level. Uh, so it's very limited in that regard. And oftentimes you don't get longitudinal data. So when you lock a brake or uh, accelerate out of a corner, it's not the grip from sliding the tire sideways, but it's spinning. Typically that data is missing uh, from a lot of manufacturers because it's hard to measure. And why is a tire hard to measure? Because it is really tricky to keep things constant, right? Imagine doing 200 miles an hour on a tire test machine, the tire is spinning like crazy, and then suddenly you lock the tire up and then you watch the grip. Well, what you also watch is the tire catching fire. So you're not looking at the slip of the tire, but also at the temperature effect. So when you see like a curve of grip, it starts nothing and you need a bit of slip, you reach a maximum, what happens after that, does it drop, does it stay consistent, depends on a huge amount of things. The load, the speed, the temperature of course, which will grow the more you slide, uh, wear levels, that sort of stuff. So the data you get only paints a very limited picture of the first little bit of data with some tolerances because tire data is not always uh, reliable. Um, the reason for the tire data not always being reliable, by the way, is that these test machines that they use are a lot of the time not like an actual tire. Well, it's an actual tire, but not on a road surface. So they have these machines with a big drum. It's a little tire here and there's a big drum and the drum turns and it spins the tire and then they turn the tire or they break the tire and then they look at the forces. But this drum can be from metal or perhaps there are some sort of sandpaper surface. It's not always identical to a tarmac. So the behavior you get from a test machine does not translate one-to-one -to, -one to what it feels like on the track and the grip levels you get on the track. So you get only a little bit of tire data. Uh, lots of it is missing. And the tire data you get only covers a small range of slip of the tire typically. Plus it's not always that reliable. And you may think, well, perhaps it is reliable, but the thing is, if you've worked in simulation for a long time, you get data from various manufacturers. And one manufacturer might have a GT tire, 
The other manufacturer has a GT tire. You know, in reality, lap times are very close. But if you look at the grip data from these different manufacturers, one tire would be 4 seconds quicker than the other. Clearly it isn't. So that means one of the data sets is wrong. Typically both are sort of an indication. And tire manufacturers also quite clearly say that, well, these are some grip numbers, but they're just sort of an indication. And pinch of salt depends a lot on other things. So they're not super confident in the data that they provide to you when it comes to grip levels. So at a pretty high level, Formula 2, that sort of stuff, you do get tire data, but it's only so-so. And now you have to keep this in mind when you make a sim, do you get magically far improved better data for the cars, or often not? And I think it's over-optimistic to, to think that uh, iRacing, R Factor 2, or Assetto Corsa, or AMS, that we always get the magic data that they don't give to the racing teams. Of course not. So you have a limited set of data that you can or cannot use to some extent. And that's the first reason why it's hard to make a tire. You simply don't quite know what it should be like. Right, so with this information, now you want to make a race sim. Uh, as realistic as you can, of course. How do you tackle this? There are sort of two uh, ways you can go about, probably more, but let's discuss the two main ones. And let's call one sort of empirical model and one is a physical model. What is first the empirical model? Well, if you uh, Google online, there are a lot of different tire models that exist. Uh, a very popular one is uh, Pacheca, which is a Dutch mad scientist professor who sort of came up with a system, equations with lots of parameters, and you get like those little slip curves that we talked about of how grip grows, how it drops, for various conditions and there are lots of papers about additions to this model for thermal effects or pressure effects and all sorts of stuff. So what you are doing is not so much looking at how is a tire constructed and how does it work, you're looking at the output of the tire and that's hugely important because you want to know the grip level of the tire with this much temperature, with this much load, with this slip angle, with this much wheel spin you look at the forces that the tire produces because the forces, they move your car around. So you really want to know what the forces are for all the conditions that the tire might be uh, undergoing. And in AMS, uh, Auto Blista and R Factor 1, the model is sort of similar. So you start with a curve, slip, grip grows, grip maximizes, and then something happens to the grip. This is too simplified and I am for the sake of this video simplifying things even more but it's very target driven because if you get feedback from a driver it says well i'm drifting like crazy it shouldn't be possible in this whatever car he's driving then you can adjust things like the drop off of that curve you can do many more things but we're simplifying things here so in a minute with some spreadsheet magic you have a new curve and you send it over he does some laps and says, oh, this is an improvement or now it's, now it's too difficult or too hard. And you can find your optimum in a matter of, well, it takes minutes to make the tire and to test the differences. And the good thing, in my opinion, about these empirical models is that things are isolated. Like what you cannot do in a tire test, because when you're testing a tire, it's always heating up, it's always wearing, that sort of stuff. In empirical models, you isolate things and that makes it super handy. So the squishiness of the tire is just a spring rate, for example, and you can add some parameters so that the spring rate is a little different the quicker you go or uh, the more load that's on it. You can keep some complexity in there, but effectively it's just a spring rate that controls the squishiness. Same for the expansion of the tire, how it grows. You can make a simple formula, how it grows in a linear way with speed or exponential with speed. Fairly simple numbers and they do not affect the grip that we just made in our curve, for example, it's all isolated. Things like, uh, like camber, how much the tire is leaning in, how that affects uh, the, the stiffness, perhaps you can do something with that, or how much it adds or removes grip, all sorts of independent numbers. And so what seems like a simple way to model a tire, it's a curve, gee, that looks like 1990s, once you add enough modifiers for that, you have very good control over specific tire conditions. And that's 
in my opinion, super important. When you start to tweak the sim, you want to have control over specific things. And one alternative way to model a tire, and that's the direction that iRacing has chosen, and also R-Factor 2, is to make a physical model. Now, I don't work for iRacing, and my knowledge about R-Factor 2's model is also limited. So, grain of salt, as always, uh, we simplify things here a bit. It's not so much like we make a curve that we can adjust, or we say this is the squishiness of the tire, this is how much it expands, and this is how it responds to camber. None of that. We actually construct a tire. Like we create a cross section of the tire, and we say here is the thickness is this thick, we have nylon, we have rubber, and these are the properties of the material, the friction properties, the temperature properties. So you actually you play sort of a tire manufacturer and you construct a tire, which is mind-bogglingly uh, complex. And hats off to Terence at ISI who made the R Factor 2 model and Dave Kammer. I may not like how it drives, which is kind of subjective as we talked about, but the code that goes into it and the skill and stuff, it's like high-end stuff. So super complicated models that somehow derive everything, the squishiness, the grip, the drop-off, the temperature stuff from this physical model. So that's super clever. Um, however, uh, a couple downsides to this. I mentioned iRacing and RF2. If you drive both, you know that they are completely different in how they feel. And that's important whether you make an empirical model, a physical model like iRacing, or a physical model like RF2. All three are just models. You wish to achieve realism with them, but they are models, they need input data. The models are inaccurate and they take shortcuts. Your input numbers are never accurate. You always sort of wonder what are the properties of rubber in the case of a physical tire model, or all right, this grip loss that I'm programming in my curve, what should that be? You never really know for sure what goes in. And the fact is, no matter what model you have, you need lots of numbers to that go in. With physical models, you can, however, not so easily isolate these effects, right? So if a driver says, I have too much slip, too much movement in the tire. So perhaps that peak slip angle is at 10 degrees where it probably has to be at eight or six degrees. And with an empirical model, I can change that curve shape and be done in a minute, hand it over to the driver and he can test it again. Uh, with a physical model, well, what you have to do is somehow make that tire stiffer, right? So that it, it flexes less. So you get your construction, your materials, you change the sidewalls, whatever you do. And who knows, you know, uh, this is super clever stuff. At the end, your tire now has a slip angle of six degrees optimum slip angle. That's great, but since you adjusted the whole construction of the tire, everything will be different. Remember the squishiness, perhaps by stiffening the tire and making the slip angle smaller, we've also stiffened it up vertically. And now our ride heights are no longer correct because the tire isn't squished properly. Perhaps it doesn't expand anymore with speed. Perhaps its relation to camber, like it's, it responds to aggressively to camber changes now. Because nothing is isolated, everything is sort of together in this physical model. And that's why I believe, and I'm fairly certain actually, that with RF2 as well, and with iRacing, these models are very complicated. They do their best, but they're also very different. So there's your evidence that a physical tire model is not some magic solution. It's still a model, still need lots of numbers. But the outcome is harder to tweak to drive a feedback, beta tester feedback. And that is, I think, uh, some of the, one of the reasons why sometimes you see slow development of these sims. Because even in RF2, which is very different to iRacing, certain things happen that perhaps aren't quite what the people want, but the guys like, like me who make the physics don't have easy tools to change the tire properties to the, into the direction that they want based on their own feedback, based on telemetry from the real cars, based on driver feedback, all the stuff that comes in, they don't always have the tools to quickly make those changes and to sort of goal-driven make those changes because everything is intertwined and when you tweak one thing, another thing gets tweaked the wrong way. So that's why these uh, physical time models are harder to, uh, to work with. Empirical models, on the other hand, are so goal-driven, as I mentioned, that if a driver gives you feedback 
that, well, normally when we go from minus two to minus three degrees camber, it's this change in, in feel. And in the sim, the change is already happening when only at half a degree of camber, for example. If you have a physical tire model, that's really complicated. Like I said, change the construction, everything changes. With a good empirical model, you simply look at the camber code that you made, or you add something to it, you add a bit of complexity, how the camber affects the grip levels, and you leave everything else alone. So discretionness is the same, etc. etc. So here's the, the, the thing. Uh, the situation is complex because we saw at first hand we don't have a lot of data and we cannot always trust the data completely. Then we have to make a sim that we want to make handle a certain way. And in the reality of game development, it has to be practical, it has to be usable by physics guys like with Iris from, uh, from Santa Corsa, or me, AMS, or uh, Michael Borda from RF2, and the list goes on. These are typically reasonably nice people, with some exceptions. No, no, they're, they're, you know, we're, we're cool guys and we do our best, but you, we also need the tools to make the cars handle, and that's harder with a physical uh, tire model. Right, so that kind of sums up what I had to say here. Um, tire data is just not very certain. There is a variety in what you get, how accurate it is, we saw that. And then applying that to a simulator, choosing an empirical model or a physical tire model, you have uncertainty and then you have a model and no matter what model you take, it's always gonna be uncertain and inaccurate to some degree. You have to fill it with numbers that have a degree of uncertainty about them and then you're driving and playing and getting feedback which is subjective so you're adding so much inaccuracy and subjectiveness that despite going for the same realism you get iRacing, you get RF2 that are very different or AMS which is a bit different again so that's hopefully giving you some insight why uh, tire models and tires are so, uh, so complicated I hope you found that somewhat enjoyable uh, to, to listen to. Leave your comments and uh, topics uh, down below and, uh, well, who knows, I might do more of these uh, talking uh, videos. I uh, kind of enjoy it even though it's uh, taking half a day already. Bye bye guys!